today we're going to kind of talk about something a little bit new for us. We, we've been kind of going back at our work and trying to figure out if there were any kind of threads that sort of linked um, the various work that we've done over the years. And we keep coming back to this thing that we're sort of interested in, which is this interplay of control and chaos. And the word control has kind of negative connotations as well as the word chaos. But somehow we think that there's, in this combining of these two negatives, that there's sometimes a positive result that kind of happens. And, um, and, and anyway, the tension of control and chaos is really what kind of makes life interesting. Uh, you know, that there's always this kind of conflict that never gets resolved. Um, so as designers, we think like we always try to control things as much as we can. We try to control our designs, obviously. But we always kind of try to control a bit our clients, get them to pick the right thing. We try to control our audiences if, we, if there's any way of doing that. Um, but we understand that total control is impossible, just as total chaos is impossible. Um, so chaos looks like this. Um, it usually shows up early on in the creative process. Um, and we think it's really that moment at the beginning of a project when you're staring at a blank screen or a blank piece of paper, and you're really kind of unsure of how to proceed. And the moment that you regain the control and the chaos goes away is the moment you make a decision, any decision at all, actually. It sort of starts bringing you down a path to kind of say, OK, well, now I have a square. All right, what am I going to do with it? Um, and, but what we've really kind of been interested always is this kind of contrast, visual contrast. So if you have something that's very geometric, you know, what happens when you throw in something that's super organic and um, just see how these things kind of work together? And, um, this was really kind of something that we were exposed to early on. Actually, for my studies, I had a professor named Lanny Sumis at Penn State, and he did something similar to this. And it really kind of drilled in my head that, uh, that this organic, spontaneous thing can always be combined with something that's very kind of staid and deadly. And it makes it just so much more interesting, this contrast of two things. Um, so what really interests about typography in particular is that it makes the blank page kind of much easier to deal with. So most projects, you may start out with a blank page, but there's always at least some kind of verbal content that's waiting in the wings. It's like the name of the company. It's like something about an event that's happening. And that's where you can always start, and it gives you a jumping off point. So all we really need to do as designers is to kind of bring in the text onto the blank page, and magic starts to happen. Um, so when we begin a new project, we already are kind of thinking about where the design needs to fall on a sort of spectrum or a continuum of like, one, should it be like extremely chaotic, like my signature here, and like completely unreadable? Um, and at the other extreme, you have something that's completely controlled, but then obviously it can be super boring. So the quest is to like, is there something that's kind of in between where readability can suffer slightly um, and where control can kind of be like maybe a formal game, like what we're kind of playing with here in terms of my signature. But arguably what's great is that you're creating something that people maybe haven't seen before, so it's something that is hopefully going to be a little bit more memorable um, as compared to the last two slides that you've seen there. Um, yeah. So. Okay. Yeah, we are really excited to share a few new brand new projects with you that we haven't even posted on our website yet. Um, but before we get there, um, we wanted to look back at our portfolio to see if there are any um, posters we've designed that kind of uh, fit to um, the topic of tonight's talk, Control and Chaos. So this was an invite we um, designed for a group show in Manhattan. Um, it was called Power Structure. The usual approach when you deal with like a group show would be to um, you know, do a really ty um, simple typographic solution, treating each artist's name equally, um, since a gallery usually wants you to emph not emphasize one artist over another one. But we were more interested uh, in the challenge of trying to visualize a sense of a power structure through typography. By doing so, we introduced a bit of chaos. So by disconnecting and distorting the artist names, we created a tension on the page that speaks to the title of the show, but also made the invite almost illegible. It requires the reader to fully engage with the poster in order to decode it. So it's not working to just skim over the poster and read everything at first glance. Um, but on the other hand, you engage more with it, and you'll probably you know, spend more time reading it than if it was uh, just like a simple design. 
Another example um, is our one color subway map. Uh, here we decided to strip all the color coding that usually exists on a subway uh, map and just have it in one color, which was like a really vibrant neon red. Um, although the result might seem really chaotic and hard to decipher, we still try to control the hierarchy of all the information so that you can actually use it. Um, the map uh, works a bit differently. So you, in order to follow a train, you don't <coughs> follow a colored line. You just um, basically connect the dots of the different subway stops. And then we decided to test the design's effectiveness by doing some guerrilla posting in the subway stations. And uh, yeah, people <laughs> had mixed re reactions. Um, you know, some t obviously, most people recognize that it's uh, not the official map, but there were people probably visiting from out of town who tried to find their stop. And uh, I can imagine it took them quite a while. <laughs> so it was definitely more an experiment than meant to be like a real proposal to the M MTA. Um, yeah, we are also very interested in how nature and weather can act on designs as an agent of chaos, affecting a design and giving it a sense of history, a patina, and transforming it in surprising ways. We think it almost looks more interesting than probably the ad that was brand new um, pasted onto the billboard. And this used to be a pretty boring sign that no one would want to read, but now it grabs our attention. Um, for a poster auction that we actually did here at the Type Directors Club, um, we wanted to try to reference this idea of a, um, in a new typographic commission. So we were giving a bit of text of a fortune cookie which read, perfection is your goal. So we started out thinking of perfection using just Helvetica, but that was pretty boring and we thought, how can we now weather it? How can we um, distort this kind of um, design? So we t um, figured out a way how to make the letter forms age and look like they have been exposed to the sun and the rain for decades. And uh, you can see how all the uh, letter shapes are now broken and uh, <coughs> disintegrated. Um, and this is like a result um, that questions our perception of perfection, that we kind of admit that um, forces of chaos and wear can also improve things, not just degrade them. Um, for a recent exhibition in London, uh, we were asked to design a poster to commemorate a counterculture movement from the 60s. We chose the Sponti movement from Germany. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. It was maybe not, uh, you know, not comparable to the Black Panthers, <laughs> but <laughs> they were kind of fun because um, they were an anarchist student group that encouraged spontaneous action against oppressive authority. So they were kind of inspired by fun, absurdist statements that would rhyme. Um, I'm just translating it like uh, liberty, equality, peppermint tea. You know, it made no sense. It was kind of some kind of nonsense talk. And we, try, uh, we thought it uh, would be interesting to, to make a typographic poster out of that. Um, and keeping in line with their attitude of the spontaneous action, um, we wanted to find a very immediate, spontaneous method to produce this poster. So we chose a totally analog process, which was cutting lots of paper and laying out the poster at actual size, so totally off the computer. So there's no Apple Z, uh, which I ho wished I had <laughs> a couple of times, and uh, Apple Z, sorry. <laughs> 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 and uh, you can't scale things, you can't retouch them, but this was actually also the challenge and was fun to do. Um, so here you see the poster photograph from above. Um, everything is still not glued, so we could move things around. Um, and we uh, chose the main slogan um, of, of the, um, the counterculture group, nonsense statt consensus. So it says nonsense over consensus. So not sure if you can read it. Um, and then in the corner, we placed this other sentence uh, of the peppermint tea and the sponty name. And this was the final design that we sent to the exhibition. So yeah, every once in a while, a project comes along where we feel like we hit a perfect balance between control and chaos. When we first cont um, were contacted by Nike to design a logo for the New York City, we wouldn't have guessed that the project would have even seen the light of day, let alone be one of our favorite projects. We were contacted by John Moon, um, the art director at the brand design division at Nike, um, to design this new logo for Nike NYC. Yeah, he gave us a number of worthy challenging goals to, to work towards when tackling this project. Um, the problem is that 
creating a logo for New York is um, that there are already so many interpretations, visual inter uh, expression of the city's name in the landscape. We want a solution that would not be just another typographic interpretation like the ones that you know already. It should really link directly to the brand as well as to the city. And we notice there's this DIY aesthetic all over the city that pervades the visual culture. Um, you see it in the improvised solutions to daily existence, like this crazy buzzer um, system that we photographed in Williamsburg a few years ago. I think it doesn't exist there anymore. It's, it's gentrified. <laughs> <I know>. And <laughs> uh, yeah, you, you can't, you, maybe you find it in Bushwick. Uh, it's, uh, it's definitely not there anymore. It's the Mass Brothers. Yeah, so okay, so now it's, it's all brass, it's probably. <laughs> So, um, so we thought it would be really good if the solution we come up with would kind of embrace this aesthetic quirkiness that you find um, in the city still. Um, and then we also recognize that there's a natural link between Nike's just do it slogan and the do it yourself mentality that exists in the city. So we thought this is definitely like an inspiration we should tackle. We, should, uh, we thought also of DIY as, um, as it relates to the growing entrepreneurism uh, in the city. You know, every year thousands of idealistic entrepreneurs launch their own businesses and products and by doing so they end up redefining certain industries. Um, then we thought it would be really amazing if the solution <coughs> could be derived from the famous Nike swoosh logo because again it would establish a clear link between the city and the brand. And the breakthrough came when we noticed that Nike and NYC both starts with an N. And we thought, would it be possible to unearth a Y and a C in this logo? And we soon found that it was possible if you erase certain letter shapes. And we soon realized that the logo actually was truly due. Uh oh. <laughs> Someone didn't turn off their cell phone. I didn't mind. Okay. <laughs> it's always you. Right? <laughs> okay. David, it's distracting. <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. yeah, no, good. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, so, yeah, we thought it's amazing because it's truly DIY. So everyone who has an old Nike um, swoosh logo on a shirt or on a T-shirt cap, whatever, you can just mark over it. You can take off the stitches, um, which we show later on on a, on a hat. Um, those are different layouts we showed to the client, how you could maybe make a stencil logo, how you could repurpose all old Nike ads to overpaint them and make them new NYC ads. And here's this DIY um, ripped out stitches. Um, there was a lot of work, but uh, I think they produce now real hats with NYC. It's not ripped off, obviously, but um, yeah. You know, I, I don't know if they didn't really embrace so much the DIY because that's what the people have to do, obviously, not the company. Um, and then they create this neon sign that flickers back and forth between Nike and NYC, reminding us that the city and the brand are kind of inseparable. This was like a basketball court graphic they developed. Um, I think that was here in, um, in the basketball tournament in, uh, in the Navy Yard. They also hired... Um, or commissioned artists like Kevin Leon to draw murals. And they also created this NYC clothing um, and tie-ins to promote Nike Super Bowl, um, which um, back then took place in New York. That was in 2014, so it's already a while ago. And Nike also rolled out a fleet of custom trucks um, that we spot uh, spotted around the city. Um, some of them were selling merchandise or coffee, and others were um, painted over by various street artists. In an era where social media has enabled the individual to have more involvement in the expression of a brand, we really liked how everyone was participating, from athletes, artists, and fans of New York. <coughs> Sorry about that. No one actually ever calls me, so it's, um, <coughs> I never turn it off. They call her. Um, so, okay, um, so... We aren't only interested in typography, but designing bespoke typefaces and lettering has been something that we've been kind of doing from the beginning. And actually, it's like really nice to be here at TDC because I think we're going to try to be a little bit more nerdier than we would normally be with um, talking about typefaces. Um, so all, a lot of this kind of came out of the fact that we worked with this one guy, Gelman. This was back in um, 
uh, back when we both started our careers, we worked for him, and this was back around 2000. Um, and this was the kind of work that he was doing at the time. It was very kind of bold and colorful, and a lot of it was very type-based. Um, and Gelman was really obsessed with type, um, and the obsession obviously rubbed off on us. And so again, we're talking about around the year 2000, so it's kind of the height of the dot-com boom. If you were there, you might remember. Um, and at that time, he was busy making typefaces like this four-pixel high font, which theoretically was going to be used for legal copy on websites, but um, I think didn't quite fly because of the readability aspects. In fact, we only used it in print, um, similar to this font, which I helped him with, which is kind of a dimensional typeface made of 20, I think it's 21 pixels high. Um, and although it was completely designed for the screen, somehow we only got print commissions, so in the end it always became like a printed thing. So this was a calendar publication for the Alliance Graphique Internationale. There's a lot of French in this presentation, I'm not, I'm not very good at it. But, um, and where we're, we're kind of setting the type in a way that's kind of inspiring textiles or carpets and, and making it kind of completely unreadable. Um, so for every project that came through the studio at the time, there was always this temptation to design a brand new typeface. Um, so when Gelman got asked to redesign the identity for the Art Directors Club, um, a bespoke typeface was something that was kind of a foregone conclusion. And the logo that Gelman had created for the club that was um, chosen was, was this logo, kind of like a stencilized cube related to the cube that they have as their award. And from that, that kind of inspired a, a geometric stencil typeface um, that would be kind of be able to be typed out with the cube. So you kind of had the cube as an element of the typeface that, rather than a separate logo. So as a young designer fresh out of school, the idea that a typeface like this, which was kind of barely readable and happened to be monospace with a lot of space, um, could constitute a visual identity was kind of, kind of hard to understand. You know, I didn't really see how this was going to work. But, um, and I was kind of initially skeptical when Gelman encouraged me to design the materials using only the typeface. So on applications like this, which was the stationary, the content was just kind of really large on the page, and then it took up like the top third, um, and that was it. And, um, and it was kind of a little bit controversial in terms of the readability of it, but, um, but it certainly looks different than the materials now, I would say, for the ADC. So it has a kind of distinctiveness to it. Um, the business cards were equally simple, and at the time, um, so at the time, like, this project was just kind of, you know, oh, you're coming out of school, it's like, oh, we're going to redesign the art director. So, oh, oh, that's not, you know, that happens all the time. And so, I, obviously, I didn't really understand how cool of a project it was, and then also, we didn't quite understand the influence it would have on us later on, in terms of this idea of, okay, you have a new project, what kind of typeface could we design for it? So, we've sort of proceeded with our own studio over the last years in kind of a similar fashion. It's like a new project comes in and, you know, we want a new typeface for every single project. It doesn't always happen, but, you know, we try. Um, now, it might seem a little bit daft to kind of design a new typeface for every new project, given that there's tens of thousands of typefaces available. Um, but mostly we kind of do it for the challenge um, and just for something to do. And, um, and often we're kind of looking for a very specific personality trait that may or may not exist that's out there, um, which we'll kind of go into some examples of how that, how that, uh, how that works. Um, and it's from a client's perspective, the benefits of having their own typeface is like pretty obvious. So whenever you can kind of tell them, look, you're going to have, this is, you're the only person on earth that's going to have this, you can have a unique voice, you know, they're, they're usually cool with that idea. So, um, so selling it is not, not so hard. Um, but the most rewarding projects are when we can create a typeface that defines like an entire identity or a brand and then becomes kind of part of it. So that's one reason why we like to work with new businesses uh, where we're there at the beginning and we can kind of define what their look and feel is. So we were brought in very early for this um, clothing brand called Everlane and um, we were hired by the founder who at that time was like 26 and I don't know how old we were, maybe like 30-ish or something. Um, so he was like this kid, but you know he was already having these great ideas. Um, it's an online, so Everland, if you're not familiar, it's an online fashion retailer that's committed to like total transparency. So consumers can kind of know where their garments are coming from, what conditions they're being made under, how people are being treated, um, and also how much profit Everlane is making. So it, it's kind of like this whole thing about, you know, transparent um, thing. And 
like long story short, in terms of their success, you know, they, they have been successful. We've watched it grow from, from being a small thing, and they have a really loyal fan following customer base, which includes like Angelina Jolie or whatever. But you know, I mean, mostly a lot of people we know who actually buy who buy the stuff, um, and you know, so they've really been able to connect with consumers. Um, now, but for, for our purposes, um, we started out with kind of a blank slate and we were like, well, what are we going to do with this brand? Because we didn't even fully understand it when it came to our doors. Um, so the inspiration was kind of predating the project by almost a decade. And for a while, we've been kind of looking at these geometry-based fonts, uh, which we've noticed in sort of a strange mix of places around. Um, and I guess they're sort of coming out of the 19th century and early 20th century. So you see them in kind of these places like, OK, a pre-war apartment building in Park Slope. You see the kind of lettering up there. It's kind of like that. But then you also see it on like manhole covers all the time. Um, I'm sure you know, an expert in type would kind of have a, a name for these things. I don't know. Um, you have see them on various types of signage. Um, and most specifically, we were kind of thinking about eye charts when we were doing this identity. And so it's bizarre that kind of like when you think about eye charts and the, the way the type is formed, like how not readable it is, but then it's supposed to be an eye chart. I mean, it's just <laughs> ridiculous. Um, but I don't know, but we liked the way it looked and it seemed to keep popping up. So, um, but, but to make the whole thing even more bizarre was like the way those things are formed, the, the sort of geometry of like, you know, these perfect circular curves and you mix them, you combine them together, whatever. Like all those things I showed you give me a retro vibe. I don't know if they give you a retro vibe. But what's weird is that they kind of look also like Euro style, which is like, you know, the go to font for like science fiction film. Like this is the future, you know. Um, so like this is 2001 A Space Odyssey, you're making a phone call and you know like that's the future and you've got Euro style. Um, so it kind of looks like that or it kind of looks like Euro Saarinen or something like a Dulles Airport geometric construction. So, so when it came to time to brand this new company, which is going to be this disruptive you know, web brand, we were like, okay, well, they're committed to timeless design, but they have an eye to rewriting the rules of the future. So we need something that kind of bridges past and future. So like maybe this is the thing. Um, so the construction is actually really almost embarrassing because it's um, it. We didn't add any nuances to detract from the pure geometry. So like the optical, we didn't optically change the verticals or horizontal strokes, no ink traps, no nothing. So it's like, this is really, <laughs> it's really geometry based. But it does give it a sort of quirky character. Oh, here's the logo, right? So it's kind of spread out, got some nice space around it. So it gives the font like a little bit of a quirkiness um, to it just by being so brutal, um, which we kind of liked. And the uniformity of it also, you know, we hate anti-aliasing. So, like, you know, if you have the fab icon, it's like perfect pixels there, you know. Like, look at the E in the word Everlane, like a blurry, blurry, blurry. But this is, like, sharp. Um, so that's great. Um, and then, you know, what we did was then pair the Everlane font with the Century School Book, which is much more elegant, refined, and everything delicate. So, you know, you kind of get these two modes sort of talking to each other. So all the applications we're going to show here quickly are um, were actually designed in-house by, they have a really talented team um, and some outside designers working with them as well. And it's a little unusual for us. Usually we kind of show stuff that only we did, but they do such an amazing job, you know, with everything, with the system that we created, and it's, you know, it's, it's great. Um, so, like, they did this full-page teaser ad f to, in the New York Times to announce the company and what they stand for, transparency and everything. Um, and then if you see kind of an overview of their sort of email blast, like it really picks up on this sort of system of like using the font really big, short letters, kind of punchy things that, that get you in there. Um, and that was something that we recommended from the start is like very, very short, punchy headlines, you know, get to the point of, of what, what's being marketed there. But they've really gone also in a sort of playful directions with it as well and kind of breaking things up and making sure that it isn't always the kind of the same approach all the time. Um, big bold things all over, you know, like all sorts of formats and um, yeah, like this. So you really start to kind of get this sense of the brand um, coming through very consistently. Um, and then they're also, they're online retailer, but they do a lot of physical things too. So they do like billboards, they do pop-up stores um, as well and like installations in the pop-up stores and, you know, uh, and projections, you know. And then 
they've also got these kind of um, things where they take over the street and they've got posters in like New York and San Francisco demonstrating the brand. So, um, so it's great. You know, like it's one of those things where it's a little bit strange for us because we're usually so hands-on. But it's amazing, like seeing even the tools that we've given them, and like see how they've evolved it and made it really like, like cool. So, yeah. so in order to control where we want to take a project, we always have to test out a lot of different concepts to find the typographic solution that works best. The process behind the search usually doesn't make it into our portfolio, though. Um, so we want to show you now. Um, um, uh, one example um, we've done for Abrams was book design uh, for F Frank, uh, Frank Sinatra to com commemorate his uh, 100th birthday. Um, yeah, so the book was to be um, a lot of, um, was to showcase a lot of photography here, um, plus an intimate memories of uh, Sinatra's buddies, uh, the Red Pack. But we really shied away from making it look like, um, you know, what you might imagine a Sinatra book to look like, like a time-life, cheesy, collector's issues. Um, so we wanted to have a really strong and cool typeface um, to showcase the personality of him, the, the music he did, but also bring it into the modern world, you know, to make it feel contemporary. Uh, this was the first approach we took, which um, looks a bit maybe too fashionable and too elegant, not masculine enough. Um, so we tried it like with different uh, uh, layouts, uh, different color shapes, but again, it's, it felt too weak for us. Um, the next thing we played around with was some constructed letter forms uh, that sort of echo a staff of music. Uh, we quickly discarded this one as well because it seemed too decorative and not very practical to use uh, as headers. You know, you could maybe just type out the word Sinatra, but we were looking for a typist that we could use as a display font in, inside the book. Um, and this was our next attempt. Um, this was kind of derived from uh, a blue note era quality, balancing the masculinity with uh, construction of a kind of stencil ostentatious S um, that seemed to evoke kind of a music um, in our minds. And again, um, yeah, this still didn't feel right. It felt too dated to us, you know, even if we colored it in and um, we thought it's just doesn't hit it right. I mean, that's what we do a lot with a lot of projects. I mean, you obviously see the final result, but there's a lot of trial and error that goes into it to find the right um, personality, because that's in the end what you have to figure out, what feels right, and um, you, you don't know in the beginning. You really have to try things. So we went back to the first exploration uh, where we showed you like this higher contrast stroke typeface, um, but we crafted this one with new letter forms, which are a bit more practical and easier to read. Um, and uh, as you can see, the letter forms relate to each other better. The T and the R and the N, they, they all relate better. And it looks more um, like harm harmonious and like a flow of uh, letters. Uh, and then the angle uh, gave it some kind of more athletic energy, which we f think fits to the man. So this was like the design of the casing of the book. That's like um, below the dust jacket. And then here you can see uh, like the typeface in use, um, you know, on some quotes. Yeah, and we think the way it was constructed, it was meant to be used big, so we also made it big. And the end papers, um, we used silver to print um, the background, um, and uh, we also introduced another motive, which were the lines. Um, it actually reveals the base language here that goes throughout the book. And you can see how it aligns with the, the type on the right side. So it all aligns to the grid. So we really try to use the um, typeface as large as possible, which um, maybe was a bit tricky to read at times. But that's why we spent a lot of time kerning and um, you know, refiguring out the rack um, to, to make it look pretty. I mean, this was all about beauty, making a really pretty book. Um, and showcasing this typeface in the best light. We also liked the rhythm of the thick and thins. Uh, it felt really buttery to us. And uh, yeah, the, you can see it's readable. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, I don't know who buys the book. Could be that someone is 70 years old would complain about it. It's uh, hard to read, but um, you know, we were happy that um, Abrams went with it. I guess. 
So we also played with scale, as you can see here, um, to just mix it up a bit, make it a bit more rhythm rhythmic throughout the book. And this was a project um, that we have worked on a long time ago, but it has uh, not launched yet because they were, I guess, just still figuring out um, how to build this company. Um, so Do Good Be Beautiful is a co uh, worker-owned company. It's a cooperative. They make safe, non-toxic cleaning products because they believe every community should be healthy. So first of all, we developed like a um, hand-painted typeface that should reflect um, the social goals they have, um, as well as um, showing that it's a small scale, local um, cooperative, not a huge uh, cold uh, yeah, company. So it should look like, uh, you know, it's made by hum humans, humans work there, and um, it's for humans. And then the packaging, uh, we were kind of a bit um, restricted because we had to use existing bottles. Uh, we couldn't do custom shapes because they didn't have the budget for it. But then we said we at least would like to um, not use any labels because we always hate the, the look of labels and um, it looks fussy. So we asked to silk screen the type directly onto the plastic bottle. And you can see we, we also uh, played with scale here again, and um, the information on the ball looks like it's jogging back and forth to create some kind of frozen motion. Um, <clears throat> one thing that we've always kind of been interested in, kind of as it relates to control and chaos, is um, if there might be some sort of universal design aesthetic, and this is probably something we could talk about longer and um, we're gonna, not going to go into it too much here, but um, so like an approach that kind of works in all instances and resonates with as many people as possible. Um, so a good place to kind of test out such a question came to us when we were asked to redesign the, this newspaper, the New York Observer, and we were asked to totally rethink kind of what they had before. So it was a sort of a large broadsheet uh, paper. You have, they had this distinctive pink paper they had it for like decades, um, and you know, it's large format and everything. So we were able to convince them to ditch the paper and the size to go to something that's a little bit more like a large magazine, but printed on really nice newsprint. Um, and right away we were kind of thinking about, okay, this idea of universality and like speaking to all of New York and as many people as who want to read a newspaper, which is basically everyone, I guess. Um, so along with this idea, we were thinking maybe there's some sort of universal typeface that could kind of encompass the diversity of New York City, like within a single face. Um, and one thing that interested us as well is this a typeface that can kind of tackle lowbrow, middlebrow, and highbrow content in one. Because we were just thinking like, you know, this is a newspaper that, you know, they might have a restaurant review on like some local delicatessen, and then they'll have an article next to it that's like some high ticket real estate thing, which is, they do, they have these things, and then like an art exhibition. So it's like, how do you handle this range? Um, so we were searching around for a while and looking for like, what is this thing going to look like? And we came across, you know, Stencil, which is this, like, ubiquitous font that's on everybody's computer, which we never used for anything. Um, but there was something about the condensed nature of the, up it's only uppercase, but, like, the condensed nature of it um, that we kind of liked and thought that maybe there was something to it. Um, so what we did was kind of basing it on those proportions we created, upper and lowercase, and we did a few different cuts. Um, and the only difference between the three cuts is that they're, they're essentially identical, but the thins get thinner. So you're kind of going from, over here we have the low brow, high middle brow, high brow, and then the, oh, sorry, that's the name over there, which is, we called it downtown, midtown, and uptown. So uptown is kind of high brow, midtown is middle brow, and downtown is low, low brow. Um, so like, this all kind of made sense to us. And, uh, <laughs> 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 and so, so well, I don't know, they, they didn't question it. Um, but what was kind of fun was like just trying these things out. Like, okay, so like, okay, you can say Grand Central, ooh, it looks nice. And then LaGuardia, you know, it's like it's a little bit punchier. Or Eleven Madison Park, oh, we should go there. And then there's a Carnegie Deli, you know. Um, Bergdorf Goodman's, anyone? Or Housing Works, you know. Like there's, there's this kind of nice thing where it's sort of, it's, it, it is the foie gras and oysters, but then it's also bagels and lox. And um, it was... Uh, like, we didn't actually think we would be able to pull it off, but we feel like in the end it kind of really has that sort of vibe of like a New York 
thing that kind of works with, with, with different stuff. So, um, so finally, this typeface came together. And then the format we picked was like a 10 by 13. Um, so it was kind of oversized, kind of big on a nice bright white newsprint and good printing. Um, and traditionally, they have always an uh, illustration on the cover. So we kind of kept that idea. We liked this idea a lot. So this is the first issue that launched with our new design with Alan Cumming on the cover. Um, some other covers. Sometimes we did like completely type only things. Um, and the large format really allowed us to play with scale. Obviously, from everything else we've heard, we really like scale shifts. So, so that was great. We can kind of do like big type here and there. Um, we could use the different cuts of the typeface simultaneously. So, like the ro more robust ones, we could use for subtitles and credits. Um, the more delicate ones could be kind of large display fonts. Um, <coughs> And this is like the back page where they always have an interview with some sort of prominent uh, New Yorker. Um, but yeah, we were kind of really liking how this worked. It didn't work for everything. You know, the idea of a universal typeface, maybe it isn't quite there yet. So, um, so sometimes what we did was we also paired in a geometric sans. So in this case, it wasn't one we designed. We, we used Hill from Jonas Heckscher. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it right, but it's quite a nice font. Um, so it allows us to kind of go in the modern realm for like s things like the style section, and then we can combine it with the serifs when we need to. Um, and while we were designing, we kept thinking about like what is the sort of visual aesthetic that's going to be as kind of appealing as possible to everyone. So again, you know, it's one of those things. You know, there's no right. Who knows if that's even true? There's no way to test it. But we didn't really want to alien any audiences. Um, so hopefully, the result of the project was you know something that any New Yorker can kind of connect with. Oh, that's me too. Um, so the question of universal aesthetic also came up again for our recent project with Google. Um, so this is a project that we were super excited to talk about, but we can't really talk about it at all. Um, so um, so we're, we can't show very much. We'll show a few things just now that are in the public domain and that are out there. Um, but it, the project is called Project Aura. Um, and if you're familiar or not familiar, so it's it's in it's a new revolutionary mobile phone device, um, and it's unlike any device on earth because what's different is that you can swap out actual hardware elements. Uh, so if your example, if you wanted to upgrade a camera on the phone, you could just swap it out with a Leica lens or whatever is gonna gonna be available. Um, or you could change out a broken screen. If you were to break your screen, you wouldn't have to get a new phone or anything like that. It just it slides in and out. Um, it's really cool. So um, the sort of extreme endpoint of that idea could be like there's this prototype from the industrial design company called Lapka, where they just have all these totally like science fiction modules that you kind of switch in. Uh, so the idea is that every R could be kind of uniquely designed for each user. So it could be something um, always different. Um, so the first task that we had was to design a logo for this um, idea. And we wanted a logo that kind of on its own hint, hinted at this modularity and the sort of myriad possibilities. So, um, so this was the logo. Um, it animates too, which we'll hopefully be able to show you at some point. But um, we're having some technical di difficulties with the video. So the goal was to, so anyway, so we have this logo. Uh, it hints at all that. Uh, and then we wanted to create a typeface from that. So we wanted a kind of consistent typographic voice on one hand. Um, that's always good, consistency. But on the other hand, we wanted a typeface that was kind of universal enough to encompass this, like the diversity of this whole thing. So again, I can't show very much, unfortunately. But um, you know, this is kind of what we were looking at. Um, another thing we were trying to do was like, is there a typeface that, when set in lowercase, could be very warm and friendly? And then if we go in uppercase, it can feel kind of futuristic and techy a little bit, you know. So, um, you know, maybe it works. And um, so for the announcement of Project R at I.O., there's a really great video here that Google Creative Lab produced, and we wanted to show you, but I think we're going to probably do that at the end of the talk because there's some technical issues here with this. Um, but 2 million, votes in, uh, 2 million views and counting on YouTube, so it's, it's, it's cool, you know. So when it comes to identity projects, um, a custom typeface is only one important ingredient in a more complex recipe that makes an identity system. A lot of times when we begin a project, we have no idea of what we 
uh, will come up with in the end. Um, so we first go in search of a variety of fresh ingredients that we can experiment with and mix together later on. The goal is to develop a toolkit of elements that will allow you to control all applications of the brand in the future. So the recipe um, metaphor is appropriate as we have begun to work more and more on um, restaurant identities. What we love about this project is that the relative freedom that we have in experimenting with various aesthetics. Um, in terms of creative freedom, restaurants are the closest thing we found to album covers as we are often able to make artwork. The artwork doesn't have to fulfill a long list of strategic objectives, it just needs to evoke a certain mood. And we recently completed a restaurant identity for the Standard Hotel in the East Village, located on the famous Bowery. And we wanted the restaurant identity to have its own distinct personality. It should have a link to the East Village, as well it should reflect the attitude of the Standard Hotels. Yeah, we thought about the idea of the restaurant being like a new neighbor to the area, whose personality will either be rejected or embraced by the community. We ended up drawing from different inspirations from the neighborhood's history in order to help plant those roots that this business would need to succeed. Um, and yeah, the neighborhood, as you probably know, has a really gritty history. Not long ago, many of its inhabitants were either artists, writers, or residents of several homeless shelters. Yeah, we were inspired by the history of the poets and writers who lived in the neighborhood. People like Allen Ginsberg, William Burroughs, or Jim Jarmusch. So we um, decided we wanted to find a manual typewriter so we could play around with concrete poetry, textual alignments, and word plays that we could later on use on the applications. So we spent a whole afternoon uh, going to this, I think, one-of-a-kind typewriter repair shop. Uh, it's in the Flatiron District. It's probably the only one that exists anymore. And we went through all their typewriters to find the one that had the right mix of typographic characteristics. We then played around for a couple of weeks, um, trying different um, yeah, typographic uh, experiments. And uh, we came up with this logo. It's a bit tilted at this moment. Um, it's a perfect square, so we broke standard in the, in the middle to have like the three rows of the logo. Um, and then the other um, component of the identity um, is a larger word cafe broken up and jammed into each corner of uh, the applications. And those two parts really play off each other. Um, they offer opportunities for diversity. Um, and you know, you have like the larger type draws your eye in, and you connect the letters to read cafe, and the smaller type is kind of like a puzzle that you want to decipher. In this case, it's a receipt card, um, and we spelled out a dollar sign out of zeros. Um, and then on the menu covers, we use different uh, yeah, type alignments that reflect the, uh, the time of the day, like breakfast, lunch, dinner, and some other food-related puns. We then also were asked to create some matchboxes, um, and we decided to make them super tiny, like sugar cubes, um, and it allowed us to play with the modularity of the system. Then you can see how the identity was applied on signage, like shark board, sandwich boards, and the entrance to the cafe. Yeah, the coaster shows kind of the schizophrenic nature of the identity, where both um, parts can live together but be separate. There's a kind of a nice interplay with the coaster and um, the cocktail glass. It either frames the glass or you see it magnified in the center. <clears throat> so like with the restaurant, um, if you're dealing with a line of products, we also want to kind of assemble the right mix of ingredients that tells the story of that product. Um, for a new business, we want to make sure that whatever we design, it communicates kind of a soul for the company, um, so that people get it and they understand it, and also, of course, accentuates what makes that product unique. So uh, one such project where we were dealing with products was for a Japanese glassmaker. And they've been crafting glassware for over 100 years, um, but they haven't really been selling much to the American market. So they decide they want to sell their glassware. Um, and they do a lot of things like hand-done stuff, and it's, it's really good quality. Um, so they decided to name the company Hikari, which is Japanese for light. And our first challenge was we wanted some kind of simple mark that could live on the bottom of glasses. So we kind of started in an obvious place with an H. 
and then thought like, you know, what happens when you imagine a sort of a thick shot glass placed on top? Like, um, I don't even know if this is possible, but would those bits of the age kind of like come down and be become like a broken circle? So you get kind of like a seal in the end that sort of both evoked a distorted age, but also kind of the bottom of a glass. So this is the logo lockup. Um, and then the main color we chose for the identity was kind of an aqua green to sort of reference the edge of glass, and we use this kind of for everything. So Hikari wanted to launch with a dozen different styles of glasses, and um, we worried that from the outset, launching with so many different styles might be kind of overwhelming for customers. So we felt we kind of had to decrease that potential for chaos, and um, each design had <coughs> and do something to fix that. Um, each design had its own unique characteristics, as you kind of see a, a few of them here. Uh, so we wanted to come up with some kind of a shorthand way to identify each style for people so that it's easier to remember and kind of fun to reference. Um, so we suggested to the client that each of these glass should be represented and connected to a different animal. Um, I'm not sure we, where, where we originally got this idea from, but, uh, but um, somehow the animal idea seemed to be like a good idea. Um, we then set about making a series of animals based on the kind of geometric form so that it relates a little bit to the, the logo that they already had. Um, so we had a practical concern, which is we needed to fit um, each of these animals into a consistent square space. Um, so we wanted them so that they could fit on a packaging. Um, but we also still wanted to capture the essence of each animal. We didn't want it to be like as if they're all kind of squished and then distorted or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a little bit of a challenge. So the first animal we designed was an elephant. This was kind of in the process and this is where he ended up. Um, and we always paired the icons with the Japanese name for the animal. So that for an English-speaking customer who's kind of seeing this for the first time, it's almost like a little Japanese lesson that you kind of understand that uh, elephant is zo or a tiger is Torah. And um, you know, the proportions are always square, so sometimes the animals were shown kind of in their entirety in a way that still kind of captures it. You, know, you couldn't really just do a head of a crane. Um, and sometimes you saw only the animal's face, like from straight on with the giraffe. So yeah, again, sometimes from a profile, um, in this case not from a distance, but from a profile because it just seems to work better for a rabbit or for straight on, and we gave him kind of like a sumo wrestler posture because we just thought that was like pretty fun. So in the end, we have this kind of set of a dozen different animals that, that each kind of correspond to a different style of glass, a different animal, but they could all live together as a cohesive set and, uh, and, and feel like a brand to some extent. So the next challenge was, okay, we have this, but we need to actually show the glasses. So we again kind of decided to do something um, a little less than practical, and rather than showing each style of glass in a sort of straightforward photography, we wanted to be a little bit more evocative and abstract. So we wanted to emphasize again the individual characteristics of each design um, in a way that was kind of a little more detailed. So much like the animal icons, we photographed the imagery um, almost as if they're kind of an icon for each one. Um, almost like an album cover that kind of goes with each collection or each design. So we collaborated with photographer Jeff Spear, who helped us shoot all this, and we were really trying to push compositions in a way that it kind of felt like this sort of fluid thing where like light is coming through and there's, you know, kind of depth and everything. So it was, it was actually like a really fun thing to kind of work with. Um, and then in the end, we again had this kind of set of images that all come together and all kind of look different, but represent these very different styles of glasses, but kind of fit together as a brand. And then on the package, you kind of see how everything comes together in terms of the uh, icons and the artwork and everything like that. So the project we show next is about to launch in a couple of weeks, so we don't even have everything printed at this moment. It's still on our desks and we are finalizing it. Um, it's a new restaurant called Sauvage in Williamsburg. Um, it's um, founded by the, uh, the owners of Maison Premier. I'm not sure if you're familiar with this um, oyster bar in Williamsburg. They just actually won a James Beard Award, uh, I think, two days ago, which is great. Um, so this is the uh, facade. Uh, they're still not done, um, but they have an amazing location. It's right uh, at McCarran Park, next door to the popular hangout Five Leaves. 
Um, so they're eyeing them already. <laughs> so they're not very pleased that they're open soon. Uh, but it's a great location. There are tons of people, so they need more uh, restaurants there. Um, so with the blessing of our client, we wanted to take a very different approach to the usual restaurant identity. Um, they basically gave us uh, carte blanche to try whatever we thought uh, would make sense. Um, one part of the identity is typographic, um, obviously. <laughs> Uh, and one part is image-based, which I'll show you in a moment. Um, so for the typography, um, we created a, a handwritten um, custom typeface, um, which is obviously is really tiny, and that's why we spaced it out, so it's uh, still readable. Um, and the name of the restaurant is always shown only really small, the way you see it here, on everything. We try to keep the size uh, almost uh, consistent, so it always looks like as if the same person wrote on it the same size. Um, and then we were experimenting for a very long time uh, what the direction of the imagery could be, um, inspired by the name, which translates, translates to savage. Um, we thought that the most primal method of creating imagery would be to cut shapes out of paper. Um, so we spent a lot, a lot of time just cutting different shapes and gathering a series of different compositions with different personalities. And uh, yeah, we liked the outcome, and um, we just thought that the paper cuts by themselves felt really flat, and maybe, you know, it looked like maybe you've seen it before, so we wanted to add a different dimension to it. So what we did next is we experimented with building small architectural spaces that we also made out of paper, and we photographed them under specific lighting. Um, and we wanted those environments to have some depth, volume, and dimension, uh, and also to bring color you know, to the identity. So we worked out a uh, series of spaces uh, that we wanted to then later on to pair with the paper cuts. So um, when we felt we had the series together, a nice diversity of color and shapes, um, we combined the flat paper cuts with the um, more dimensional photos, and we um, did like a dozen of compositions. And each one has a different uh, personality. It's a bit like an icon, but unlike Hikari, which really each icon stand, stood for something like an animal, here the meaning is a lot more ambiguous and um, it's more on an emotional level. And then we use those paper cutouts also um, reversed. Um, and this is like their splash page that's online already. And it's just like, uh, you know, refreshing with all those different um, icons. And we decided to print um, everything on uncoated paper because we really like the tactile feel. But unfortunately, as you know, CMYK colors look really dull uh, printed on um, uncoated stock. So we swapped out the standard printing colors with matching neon pantones. I mean, it's hard to see, but um, imagine the left-hand side would just be your regular CMY. And on the other side, it's like the neon um, com um, com uh, matching color. So this was really, it, I mean, we did a few test prints already, actual offset test prints, and you can see how, how the contrast happens, you know, as soon as you have like a neon yellow on a uncoated paper stock, it just, you know, feels a lot more vibrant and it adds another dimension to the artwork. So each menu has a competition on the back side, um, and on the front side is the menu items, which we paired with um, Grilly Types font Waltzheim. And our handwritten type, you can only see on, as on the logo and the headers. It just became too unreadable. And, you know, it, you have to see the practicalities of a um, restaurant business where they have to change out um, the menus every day. And, um, you know, it, it wouldn't have worked with using handwritten type everywhere. Uh, and then the drink menu is a bit distinguished from the other materials um, by having the artwork show up only on the borders, again, cut out. It's like uh, another example. And then those are the business cards. And then what's great about it, they really want to print everything. So we did coffee cups. Um, then we also uh, created like a pattern for wax paper. Here we could only do one color. So we, you know, we tried to always do four color, but it was really tough to do it on every application. This is like for sandwich uh, paper, uh, butcher paper, um, and then for the french fries, they use that on the table. Those are coasters. And then we produced also a couple of promotional materials again, like uh, this time 
we wanted to do the opposite as what we did for the Café Standard. We made those Jumbo matchbooks, so they're really huge. Um, I think they will take money for those <laughs> because you can't just take, uh, give them as takeaway. Uh, and those are tote bags. Um, I haven't seen them printed yet, but hopefully look, will, will look good. Um, so new businesses can almost be probably the easiest projects to work on to some extent because you start from a blank slate and um, in some cases when you're dealing with a very established company we have sort of a different challenge which is how to square the vision of all the kind of people who built the company and make everybody happy. Um, so and it's even trickier when the client happens that you're working with happens to be a group of like equally opinionated designers. Um, which we're so used to actually, we never work with designers, we work with you know, people who are not from the field maybe, so it's, it, it can be tough. So there was kind of no telling what would happen when this project came through our door um, to do an identity for a lighting architect company called L'Observatoire International. And um, so I don't know if you're familiar with them, but L'Observatoire's work is like really amazing. So like arguably they're the leading lighting arch architects in the world. Um, and so therefore, they kind of work with some of the most legendary architects on the best commissions. Uh, in New York, they've done um, tons of stuff, but they've done the High Line, they've done the Met, they've done Lincoln Center, they've done like a lot of stuff. Um, and worldwide, they've done projects like here, the Frank Gehry Foundation Louis Vuitton. Um, so one long-term collaboration that they've, um, they've done is with architect Stephen Hull. And um, it's only my opinion that I'm speaking now, but I think these are amazing. Um, you know, they bring like this real poetry to the buildings, and I think Hull's stuff is kind of like very monumental forms. And when you see them kind of as they're contrasted from day to night and like what they've done in terms of lighting, I mean, it really has this transformational effect on everything. So, um, so yeah, I would definitely recommend you checking out their stuff. So um, as we started to work with them, uh, one thing that we wanted to do was kind of go through their entire portfolio, obviously familiarize ourselves with it. Um, and as a pretty early way of understanding it, we started doing this thing where we were kind of taking little detail shots of like how they were dealing with lighting, because we never really even thought about lighting as a, in terms of spaces. So we like wanted to kind of understand what it, their process was. So we were doing all these like little collages where we we're putting all these together, which we kind of like the way those look. Um, but for all the like loveliness of the things that they've done, all this great stuff, you know, this is their logo. I mean, it's like they've had this logo for many years, and it's like straight up Helvetica. And we're like, oh wow. So, um, you know, we really have to do something here. Um, and um, so we're always kind of looking for inspiration. The name L'Observatoire is observatory in English, and um, uh, duh, yeah, okay. Um, and then so. <laughs> So, um, but it, it hints at one of their interests, which is they're really interested in astronomy and kind of celestial bodies and all this stuff. So, um, so we started from there with kind of an idea. And, um, you know, we crafted a new typeface for them, which is this kind of skeletal structure with a consistent stroke weight throughout. So it's kind of like almost like the trail of a comet or something like that or whatever. So they're using this on, on stuff. Um, but the problem we kept running into was the name itself. You know, it, it has a nice meaning, but it's long and it's very cumbersome to say, and especially for um, Americans as well, but also Asian clients, apparently it was kind of difficult to sort of um, navigate this name. So we, we thought you really need like a kind of a shorthand version of this or something. So, so we convinced them to change it to Lo. And um, what's kind of nice about Lo is that um, and we didn't know this when we recommended it, but the pronunciation is similar to Lo? Okay, she knew it. Okay, sorry. Why did you let me? You should have warned me. <laughs> so we presented it. So this means water. So they were like, oh, well, that means water when you say Lo. And so we thought, oh, that's the end of it. We're, it's never going to work. But actually, they liked the idea because they said that light kind of plays upon surfaces in a way that's kind of reminiscent of water. And it was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. that's what we meant. Um, <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
so anyway, so they, they were like, yeah, we love it. Low. So we were like super excited that they would make this kind of radical um, shift. And um, so we went forward with kind of making a mark for them. And so obviously you see those big O's and the first thing you think is, oh, wow, you know, that could be like the, uh, the earth or something. So we realized that, you know, we could have this sort of celestial body thing going on. Um, and then if with a little bit of creative license, the moon isn't actually that close to the earth. But what do you know, whatever. It's like, you know, it's sort of an orbit. Um, <clears throat> so in the end, we kind of said, okay, well, your logo should be this. You know, you've got um, this kind of shape going on there, and it kind of hints to all those things that we were talking about. But uh, one thing we hadn't yet explored with the identity was actual light, you know, because you have this identity that's going to exist in the real world, and there's light all over the place. How do you create something that kind of reacts to it in the same way, you know, like some of these things do, um, engaging with the light? So we said, look, whenever it's printed, um, you should always have, we're going to make a die, and it's going to have all these kind of different sort of levels to it. And it's not going to use any ink at all. It's just going to be something where, depending upon the light, you kind of see it one way or the other, and that's it. Um, so this is their logo. This is how it fits on their business card. So it's all very kind of, the identity is very minimal, a lot of white, just some black bits here and there, and then the kind of embossing thing. So this works great on a physical piece. It doesn't necessarily translate to web. So um, what we then did was we worked on some uh, 3D graphics, um, to tr and we did kind of a capture of a period of time where we sort of simulated the sun rising and falling. So like, um, if you go to their website, you go to their contact page, you know, depending on what time of day it is, you're going to get something that sort of corresponds to what's happening with the light as it relates to in, in New York. So um, so this was fun. So this was kind of a segue into the website, which we then tackled. And um, so once the identity was set, the main focus was kind of creating a website that was really sort of showcasing their work in a nice way. Um, and they have like a huge portfolio. So a lot of it is like information graphics and kind of dealing with this architecture and information architecture and kind of figuring things out. So we have kind of dynamic menus that sort of open up from left to right, which is like a real pain in the ass um, for the programmer. Um, but And then lots of like big, big, big photos. Um, we used as the base this dark web safe gray because we wanted to make sure that the lights, the very light areas, the very dark areas, the shadows and the highlights all kind of, you see them, you see the actual shape of the image. Um, we use this kind of inert black areas, so like certain type, like here, it's like if you're not using it, it becomes black, if you roll over, it becomes white. So like all the white on there is kind of like lit in the sense that it's kind of uh, lit. So yeah, so like again, lots of big imagery up there, that's really important. And um, you can navigate through the projects in all sorts of ways you want. You can do it by client, obviously, and you get a nice list there. Um, or like image view, thumbnail views. Um, Um, and then what was really kind of cool is that we could bring it all back around and say, you know, in addition to, um, you know, your name is Observatory, let's kind of do a map that's a bit like the night sky or something. So we were able to adjust Google Maps in a way that kind of, you get these little glowing orbs that you can kind of roll over and then you can see globally like all the projects that they're working on and get more information about. So it was a kind of a nice thing as well. So that's that's actually it. Thank you. It's uh, it wasn't much of an ending. We can have we wanted to show this video and maybe some other things, yeah. but maybe we'll take some questions uh, if you guys want. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. We usually ask for at least a month uh, or one and a half months time of concepting and uh, working on the presentation. We try not to share ideas with the client prior to the presentation, so we rather work out one to three directions and uh, we put in like similar like we showed tonight. Um, you know, references, inspirations, um, 
and then we show application, notional applications that look like they were real, really. Um, it's interesting you ask that because we actually brought one of our presentations for this class client because we thought maybe it's in, we never show that kind of stuff. Maybe it's interesting to kind of show our process yes. of how we present it. Yeah, because so I we can do that. Yeah. In your presentation, that I love the way that you talk through your thinking process and then you're kind of sold by the end of it. Yeah, I think to your to your mm -hmm. question, we don't do that thing where we sign them on board first and then show them application. We do it all at once because we feel like showing the applications is really what can bring it home to them. Like they need to see these designs. In application, so like for example, with this one observatoire, we showed them that business card before that business card was produced. I mean, it didn't look very good; it was mocked up. But you know, at least it gives them a sense of like this is what my identity can be in the end. So yeah. Yeah, but those uh, inspirational images are extremely important. I think you can't come in and say, "Oh, we just say low now," and that's how it's going to be. Um, I yeah. think we didn't maybe expand on upon this, but we really told them, you know, it, why it makes sense to make it shorter. Just for social media, you just have a square. You can't always say Observatoire International. It's hard to pronounce for people. So we showed them a lot of reasons why it didn't work, because in the first place, they didn't really want to change it. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge step for them to say LO instead of the whole name. Um, but uh, they, they understood that it's much more practical. And we showed, I think, a couple of different pro uh, directions, no? like three or four. Yeah, I think five, actually. And because five. this whole theme with light it, uh, encouraged so many ideas. Uh, you can do so much. And we showed things that were way out there. You know, it's like where type changes uh, has a drop shadow well, we based can, on the... We can show it. I think Abby <laughs> yeah. has to change the orientation of this or something. And then we yeah, can show it, I, actually, yeah, if know. people are interested. Yeah. Um, it's a bit complicated. Yeah. I, uh, do you guys study like plot design? Since that's not no, we're self-taught, and um, you know, so it, it shows up in some ways. <laughs> no, we just uh, uh, studied visual communication or graphic design, and then we learned from Alexander Garman that you actually, as designer, you can try to customize your typeface. You don't have to be a professional. You know, you can maybe start with a pixelated font, and then you grow and you you try things. Um, and uh, yeah, David is uh, much more uh, also better in that, and he has more experience. Uh, I do more the hands-on stuff. <laughs> yeah. well, we also like things yeah. that are a little bit quirky, like even with the titles for this, for this one, we just yeah. made it in InDesign. Like we just bump up like it's a single thing. stroke. You know, yeah. like sometimes it's like fun to even just do things really badly. You know, just because it has a sort of character to it that's kind of nice. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Um, yeah. Does anybody ever, I mean, maybe you're too established for this, but does anybody ever come to you like, we want a mural, and then you figure out how to upsell them into an identity? Or, uh, like, does anybody ever come to you for one thing, and then mm -hmm. somehow you wrangle them into something else? And then mm -hmm. do you set up the, like, that period of discovery to, like, kind of lead them into that? Or, mm -hmm. this is, yeah. I have to think about that if that ever happened. Ever happen? Or does everybody yeah. just come to you like, we want a full-blown identity and like 15 applications? And no, I wish. <laughs> Sometimes it's just the logo and the typeface, unfortunately, because they yeah. don't have the money or they don't have the need to produce all, all those things, which would be great, and you have a whole system. Um, but I think... I don't think so, because I think, I mean, I don't know, maybe your experience is different, but I guess with ours, like, you know, either you have a company that comes to you with nothing because they're a mm -hmm. new business right. and you have to do everything, or... They're a company like, let's say it's a Nike or something like that. You know, they, they need a specific thing. And they don't want it to see, oh, I have a new logo for Nike. You know, like that. So I don't know. Somehow it hasn't come to us. I can imagine how that, that could happen. But it, yeah. it doesn't, doesn't yeah. happen to us. Yeah. 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 Okay. A lot of the type that was shown in the beauty lives in the eligibility of it. As a designer, you can fully appreciate like, the importance of that. How do you sell that through to a client as like, hey, this is the right way to go? Yeah, we were actually um, pretty, let's say, lucky when we worked um, for a Roth gallery um, to make this distorted type poster, you know, this group show that we showed in the beginning. I mean, I, I know a lot of designers have, ha have it hanging on their wall because they just like it visually also. And um, I think he understood that uh, it doesn't need to look like, uh, you know, it's from Roth gallery. Everything didn't need to look the same. So we were able to brand each show and each um, exhibition in a unique way. Um, this is really rare, I think, because if you went to a really established gallery like Gagosian, they probably would never allow you to do this. So I think you have to have also a bit of luck to have a client who understands the value of something like this and is into it. 
Um, because I think if someone is just against it, and we had this too, you can't convince them then. If they say, I can't read it, doesn't, I don't like it, you can try to find a compromise, but you can't, uh, sometimes you can't convince them, um, I think. Right? I think we also self-edit a bit. Like yeah. I think that we get, when we meet the client, we kind of can get their vibe and we know, we know okay, we shouldn't, we can't push this too far. And like some of like the guys she mentioned, Roth, like we had a really nice relationship, so we can say, look, we think we should, you should do this. We can push them a bit more. Maybe. Yeah. In hindsight, is I think it's pretty unique <laughs> that we were able to do it for mm. such a client. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I assume you are married or perhaps still dating. Each other. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, how is the relationship? Between like you know, being married and working together, and like, can you talk about that? And who is <laughs> suicidal? Yes. What? What's the last part? Who is control and who is cow? Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. you choose. You choose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know who's de de depends. <laughs> uh, depends on the day. I think. Uh, I don't know. I think it, it's. We never plan to work together, but I think. I don't know. It just happened naturally, to be honest. I mean, we were mar married before we worked together. That's very mm -hmm. important to say. <laughs> and then we were both not really happy in our jobs. And we had this Roth Gallery and some other clients on the side. And we really liked to both work on it because we were both so hungry of experimenting. And we didn't have a ton of work on the side. So we both worked on the same project. And we didn't have an ego. It was all about, oh, that's better. Let's use yours. And then next time, oh, yours is better. Then let's do this and uh, I think we are that's important I think that you don't have such an ego and uh, yeah, we you, also, you have the same aesthetics yeah. obviously you know yeah, we had like the same mentor also <laughs> so that mentor, I think yeah. we kind of came to the whole thing to get at the same point and in a way that we sort of agreed on like what what we liked what looks good so um, that helped a lot I think, yeah. I think it was like having the same goal doing similar work and then it, it, it works naturally I mean I think I know there are a lot of actually there are a lot of couples who work together in design. I know people always say, "Oh my God, how can you do it?" But it's actually not so uncommon in that field. Um, yeah. And are you controlling on chaos? Or <laughs> I say it, it depends on the topic I think no? so. and I, on I the think day. It does, yeah. yeah. Not, not I think, think when yeah. like in a client meeting, I think I'm sort of control and everything else I'm chaos, and then <laughs> and let's say like, like this, I'm maybe know. less diplomatic, you know, yeah. and I'm not as patient. Maybe that's. Uh, and he's better at smoothing and talking about it, <laughs> which you saw tonight probably. No, he's, he's good. I mean, you really need to sell your ideas, and that's important to know how to sell it. Uh, with some clients, it's easier because they respect you, they hire you because they like you, and that's great, and they appreciate your work. But some clients say, who are you? I just want you to do it the way I want it. So um, it really depends on the, on the client. Um, and it's great if you can choose at some point, if you can really choose the client's that appreciate your design and let you do good work. Yeah. I don't have a question necessarily, yeah. but um, oftentimes when I go, come to talks, I look at the work and I'm like, ah, oh, I can do that. That's cool. You know, or I'm oh, go on. <laughs> heavily critiquing things. Uh, I've seen you guys maybe four or five times speak now, and mm -hmm. each time I walk away just like, damn, I gotta do work. Oh, oh come <laughs> on, Jonathan. <laughs> uh, really, uh, really appreciate yeah. the work you guys. Thank you so Thanks, much. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, man. Yeah. Yeah. You guys have any questions? Any more questions? Yeah. 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 In a lot of your work, I've noticed you have like, there's some experimental aspects and like the creative art alongside the design. And I wonder how much of that is driven by like, the actual project you're working on, and how much of that comes into it from maybe like personal things you're exploring. Did you mean like specific projects, like the subway map or something like what, what, what was, what, what do you mean? Um, just, I noticed like for like the, uh, some of the restaurant you've done, you've done like paintings or things like that, mm -hmm. in addition okay. to the type design and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah as a, we also have that in our portfolio for a long time where we did hand down or hand painted typefaces or graphics and um, the client who hired us for the standard he actually looked at our portfolio and he said, Oh I like that you have this mix of, you know, artistic and also you know, traditional graphic design. So we, and because he was looking for something that was a bit more illustrative. Um, and um, I think that's great and uh, unfortunately there are not so many opportunities. Uh, to do such things, you know. I mean, we mentioned album covers because there you don't compete with an object or with a product; it's invisible. And with a lot of things, you can't 
because um, you you as a designer or your work has to be in the back because the product, like with Everland, it's all about the clothing. I mean, the typeface was uh, used pretty large, but then you can't really compete with um, artwork. Maybe if you do a special campaign and you can introduce that, but for an identity system, it's pretty um, pretty difficult, I think. But I think you have to experiment it on your own because that's what we did. Otherwise, you will never be hired to do something like this. They wouldn't look at your work and you have nothing in there that looks like you, you painted something or you built something by hand. Uh, I think then they don't come to you and say, oh, let's do something. And that's I think uh, with us, we like to experiment just by, we just like it. You know, like we get bored and we say like, you know, there were two projects with cut paper. I think at some point we were just kind of like, well, why don't we just like cut paper? Because it made sense for the project, but also... Like, why not? Get off the computer, do something different, try something else. Maybe it looks good, maybe it doesn't. But, you know, at least just force yourself. Mm. Like the standard where you did the painting, you know, it was... Maybe didn't show that tonight. Yeah, yeah, with Narcissa. I mean, you know, it's just, it was fun. It was fun to mm. do it. So that's why you do it. Yeah. But we also hire sometimes illustrators, which we did once for Blonde Redhead for this four-legged uh, mm -hmm. woman. You remember? That's what was done by an illustrator. So we draw abstract things when it's not about making something look too realistic. We obviously not you know, painters, uh, great uh, fine art painters. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You, uh, it seems like the fonts, like you try to make you, like, don't you think you could find something very similar to what you're doing? So I'm trying to re reinvent something that's already <laughs> out there and really work extra so hard and trying to invent all that. So you mean like yeah. we, we, do, we put too much work into it, yeah. I don't, I don't, I'm curious. Uh, you're creative. Yeah, I mean, um, you, you will, yeah. it's, it's part of the process. Fun. I mean, the way that yeah. they come up, like, you know, the, you know, their concept is by designing the typeface. Designing the typeface is part of the process of like how they. So you cannot separate the typeface <laughs> from you know, the finding right. something that's cheaper. So like, you really could, you know, do hurry up the process. So. Actually. To your point, was aren't there a million typefaces out there? There are, but there are not many good ones out there. I'm not saying that we only drew good ones, but. Once That's you not true. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, no, but, but I feel like sometimes you search for something like a detail or something that has to fit to something. You know, like you have a really uh, concrete idea about how it has to look, and then it's really hard to find it, I think. I don't think, I, I, I wouldn't yeah. say that there's not many good ones. I would say that there's a lot of revivals and there's a lot of mm -hmm. things where people are kind of following down the same path. And so you can kind of segregate, like, um, you know, in Ceres, you've got this mode of thinking, this mode of thinking, there. and if you're not, if someone's not covering something in between, then it's not there. Um, so I think, like, even with the thing where it was based on st the stencil font, you know, I've never seen a, a font with that proportion, so that's why we did it. But it could exist. Maybe we just don't know. I looked for it. I, I couldn't find it. But, um, you know, so it, at some point, it's a little bit fun. But it's also like sometimes it doesn't exist. And then I think going back to what we were saying about ingredients, like there's something nice about when you start with all these ingredients and you're ready to do the cooking and you've got like like a new typeface that you made because it's like it pushes you in a way that you're just like you really want to work with it. And you're like, okay, let's make it work somehow. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of fun. Yeah. It gets addictive, you know. It's like, it's like, it's like a bad addiction, actually. <laughs> it's not good. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. I have a really lame answer. Do you have an answer? To that? <laughs> no, I don't know. I, I just felt like we talk about it sometimes. Uh, it's actually good when you have projects going on in different stages. So you're not usually starting with five projects at the same time. So, you know, you may be concepting at one project, but you're already doing the production, let's say, on the other. So you don't have to think so much, but you get stuff done. And then there's this cross-pollination going on, you know, across the project. So you feel like, ah, you know, I thought about this. Well, we did the research here. Maybe it applies there better. Or... I, don't know, I think it's not a bad thing. I guess if you're just focusing on one project, it's not necessarily better, you know, I think. I think it's good to have multiple things going on. Yeah. I think we've, we've asked this of you before, but you guys compete, right? Compete? Yeah, a singular client comes in, you're Never. pitching ideas. Yeah, I've heard. 
And then um, we wrestle, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> um, she always wins that. No. <laughs> no. no. Um, but to that question, mm -hmm. uh, if, if David's doing something that allows you to do something else, so mm -hmm. it's sort of a that's true. Yeah, yeah. that's good. Yeah. I, I think that helps with time management. Like, I think if we were, we couldn't have done our business if we were just one person. Like, we we know that about each other. Like, it just really helps having two or yeah. more, maybe. But you know, two and not just for the time management. It's also just that you need some feedback. You know, yeah. I, I guess if you're in uh, by yourself, I mean, I guess that people can work like this. I feel like um, I couldn't be as productive probably. Um, and also, it's good if someone comes in, sees it with a fresh pair of eyes and says, you know what, that doesn't work the way you think it works and maybe you have to change something. Um, no, that's, that's yeah. helpful. Yeah. She's good at that, saying it's, it's not that's working. That's a good thing when it's you're married, working. you know, yeah. it's not... Uh, yeah, there's no boundaries you can kind of... It's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, yeah just all pros and cons. That's how it is. Yeah. Yeah. Are there other studios that you really admire the work of right now? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of studios. Um, For a lot of different reasons in, also. Yeah. In which city? Mm -hmm. like, uh, um, yeah, Jonathan has a really cool studio. You should yeah, check it out. Check we should out. do it all. Um, and there's, I don't know, like, and I, can, I can only speak for myself too. Yeah, like, it's like, that, maybe you start. Like Rodrigo Corral, I like, I, I think yeah. this Mario Hugo and Hugo Marie's doing good stuff. I mean, you know, the thing is like with New York and I even like globally, it's like, there's so many really great small design firms, and you're learning about new ones all the time. I feel like, and there's just, just a lot of cool point, stuff. But just to his point, I feel like yeah. it's usually smaller firms um, yeah. that do really excellent work. Um, I mean, obviously there are agencies who also do good work. Uh, I just feel like we we tend to like the artistic stuff more, um, you know, less. I mean, branding. I liked, for instance, the Whitney Museum branding a, a lot. I like yeah. I like what they did, you know, That's and great. that was really fresh. Um, yeah, like MM is, Paris, we like also yeah. um, for different reasons. You know, they're all completely different. We like Cyan; they're from Berlin. They do really amazing poster design. Um, and our our choices are probably not very esoteric. Like it's a lot of people that you've heard of or whatever, like Tibor Kalman or something like that. You know, it's like not, um, you know, but but they're great. You know, these are great people, great designers. Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, you talk about working with um, Andre Boaz, and then also if you're doing Narcisa and the Standard Cafe, did you present contrast and identities at the same time, or, or how that um, yeah, that was actually a really pleasant experience because the client was as crazy and nerdy about design as we are. I mean, we didn't work with Andre Balas. He has his team of people. We actually worked with James Truman directly and uh, Claire Darrow. Um, and Max was the creative director, so um, they had a really clear vision of how it should feel, but they didn't, they didn't tell you much more than just the feelings you should get. You know, oh, it should fit in the East Village. We want to feel like we are part of this. Um, you don't want to feel like an outsider who slaps something completely different onto the people who live there. Um, and um, they also had Sean Hausman for the interior design, which was excellent. Like, every detail was custom made. It was such a eye uh, to every, um, everything they created there. And um, so we did so many rounds of revisions, like each paper shade, like we used the pink color paper for the coffee standard. And uh, I think we looked at every pink shade that exists in America on pa uh, mm -hmm. in paper. And we put it also not just uh, you know in our office. Now we had to go to the place, put it on the table, and see how it works in the light. So they were extremely like anal about everything, which I liked actually because I also want to do the right decision. And it's great if you have a partner who just cares about everything produced correctly, you know, because sometimes you have a client who says, oh, you know what, we just print it digitally, <laughs> who cares how it looks, you know, it's, it should just be cheap, <laughs> which sometimes it makes sense, you know, but it's also nice if you see your work, especially in this digital age now, being produced in a really nice way. Um, and we showed them different ideas. We actually, what you see here for the Capistano, which was all typewriter, we did a lot more crazy stuff. This is very conservative, actually, and we also designed a lot more applications. And but the realities are sometimes they don't need all those applications, and they just want one graphic for this card. They don't want ten or whatever, and they want it in a specific way, and that's fine. You know, this is just the way it is. Um, and we also just show what we've created, uh, produced in the end. Um, yeah, but uh, it was really pleasant. I mean, it's 
Yeah. It's great to work for people who really have an eye uh, for design and uh, high quality standards. That's it. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Thanks.